Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for this access into your presence, thankful for the wonders of your grace and the greatness of your love that you have for us, thankful for the privilege that we have to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who opens it to us so that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle of John. And in our last study together, we'd spent some time on verse 16 of chapter 5. And I pointed out that I did not believe that there was a break between the 15th and the 16th verses and that we were told that if we ask anything according to God's will, he would hear us and he would answer that. And, and we have an illustration of that in the 16th verse. There is sin that doesn't face death, that is not toward death. The word there in the Greek is pros, toward. And there is sin that, that does face death or is toward death and the 17th verse says that all unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death we shouldn't be distinguishing between good sins and bad sins so the 17th verse begins with a very dogmatic statement that all unrighteousness is sin there aren't little sins and big sins and kind of those in between it's all sin but there's sin that is toward spiritual death, and there is sin that isn't toward spiritual death. And I believe the Holy Spirit is drawing a distinction here between the believer and the non-believer. This is the old man the, the, who can do nothing but sin. Uh, if, if, you, if we know that the old man, that's all the old man does is sin, we all know, we know that the new man cannot sin. Uh, I do not believe that we're looking at a, at, a, at a portion of text here or scripture that refers to the sin unto death as being physical death, but, but spiritual death. And that's the old man. Uh, if you want to Think of that as the old man, which we remain nothing but an old man unless we're born of God. When we're born of God, we now have two natures. We're no longer a single-natured individual, and that new man cannot sin. The, the request that was made in the 16th verse was by somebody who saw his brother sinning, and I, I suggest to you that he's the one that gets an answer. The context clearly says if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and he answers it. We get what we ask. And now the very next verse, here's somebody asking concerning his brother, in which case God makes it clear that as far as our brother is concerned, he cannot sin toward death because he's been made a sinless new creation in Christ. His new man cannot sin. And I'm not sure that the brother seeing the brother that is doing this sin that's not unto death doesn't also need to know that he's a new sinless creation in Christ where that his new man cannot sin and there's no judging going on. So I, th I think that the Lord is giving assurance to the one asking that as far as both he and his brother is concerned, Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. That's what I'm seeing in the text. And there are a multitude of people today who think whether or not we're going to heaven is dependent on how we live. And there are some people who live so badly that well, they ought to go to hell. And then there are, there are others, that, well, they're living pretty good, so there's just nothing God can do but send them to heaven. And folks, none of that is true. None of that is true. We know that we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have died to sin. We're dead to sin. God provided a substitutionary sacrifice, one who died in our place, so that now we have a new man who is created in righteousness and true holiness. And until we understand that, we have problems with lots of passages of Scripture. There's a sin that doesn't face death. Now, how can there be 
sin that doesn't face death? Well, we know the answer to that. We know that those who are born of God do not sin, present tense. It's not saying the new man doesn't, you know, sin all the time. You know, the new man doesn't habitually sin. You know, that sometimes the new man sins, sometimes the new man doesn't. Folks, the new man cannot sin. In the 19th verse, we read the whole world lieth in the wicked one. That's a present tense. So you wouldn't say the whole world habitually lies in the wicked one. There isn't any habitual about it. And how many times has this been stressed? Well, five times, at least that I see in 1 John. We know that everyone born of God does not sin. Folks, you can't look at something so emphatic and so repeated and not take it into serious consideration. What does it mean? Does not continue in sin. Well, you have put off the old man. Those of you who have followed us through these studies, you know that we put off the old man, which is corrupt according to his deeds, and you've put on the new man that is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's not something that we have to do. I'm not going to stand here and tell you folks that you need to put off your old man and that you need to put on your new man when the very text that we're looking at states that we have done that. This very book states without question that that is something that is we've done. It's done. You've put on the new man that's created in righteousness and true holiness. And it's that new man, that seed of God that dwells in you that cannot sin. Folks, have you reached the stage that is presented to us by the Holy Spirit in the seventh chapter of Romans? You know, if I do that, which I would not, then it's not I, but sin that, do, but, but sin that dwells in me. And people can say, well, you know, Paul wasn't really very mature when he said that. And folks, I don't think we're looking at Paul's maturity. I don't think we're looking at his reasoning, his logic, or his opinion. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to us. If you don't believe that, then I don't see how you can have any peace. You know, but instead the thought is, there's no way God could take me to heaven the way I live. And if that is how you take that verse, and if that's how you take many of these verses, then folks, there can't be any real peace. The text is saying, you don't go to heaven because of the way you live or the way you don't live. Dearly beloved, you belong to God because he birthed you, okay? You're his. I've met many a Christian over the years, and the minute I meet them, they launch, normally, usually, they'll launch into everything that they've done for the Lord. They've done this, that, and the other thing, and you just sit and listen, and you think, boy, man, I've never done stuff like that. I've never done stuff like, like you did. And then I meet other Christians where it's 10 years later before I find out how famous they are and what they've done. And I think of that passage in Matthew. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works? You know, sounds like a lot of Christians I've met. Dearly beloved, is that what we're going to say the first time that we meet our Lord? I'd like to think that the first time I meet him, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say, Lord, I love you. I trusted you. You died in my place. Thank you for dying in my place. I want you to note that this epistle closes out. It ends with a lot of no's. Okay, we know, verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Perfect, passive, okay? They didn't do it. They didn't have anything to do with it. There isn't anything left for you to do. And so people have asked me, well, you know, what do I do then, Steve? What do I do? Believe on him whom he sent. We know that all who have have been born of God, do not sin. And if you want to argue with the present tense, that's up to you. I don't think Christ is, is telling me that a corrupt tree doesn't habitually bring forth evil fruit. I think he says it brings forth evil fruit, period. 
But he that is begotten of God, and again, God forces us by repetition to consider the weight of these words, born of God. So it's no surprise to me that the text would say, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now, I believe that the King James has made a terrible mistake here in translating the Greek, and, I, and I'm sure that all of you King James Version diehards out there, you know, nothing, you know, God inspired the King James Version, and there's, there's no other version but the King James. I'm sure you won't like me saying that, but the King James translated this from the Greek, and I don't think it did a good job, but it's up to you to decide for yourself. Now, the reason, the main reason, primary reason, I think that the King James really messed this up is, I say that, because it puts a burden on you that you can't possibly bear, that you're responsible for guarding yourself, and if you don't guard yourself, well, then you're in big, big trouble. You know, well, what if I don't guard myself? And by the word, the word guard there is, is it's a little different than the word tereo, where we guard his commandments. This is... Uh, Fulox, so this is a, a military guard. All right, now those of you who have been in the military, you kind of know, you know, how that works. It's a military guard. If I have, well, if or since I don't guard myself, well, I, then I must not be born of God. That's basically the conclusion I'm going to come to. And now we have Christians by the thousands who have very little peace, if any. If I've really been born again, then I, I guard myself, and the evil, evil one will never touch me. But if I don't guard myself, then the evil one touches me, and now, now I'm in trouble. You know, if I don't do that, then I, I have to reach the conclusion that maybe I'm not going to heaven, and there's not a whole lot of peace going on here. I believe that the language, without question, the language says... All who have been born by God do not sin, but God protects them so that the evil one cannot touch them. That's what I believe the language says. I'm tempted to see this as the sinless new man guarding himself. I'll admit that, okay, which would seem to make sense at first glance. You know, the new man can't sin, okay, so the new man's going to guard himself. I, it's very tempting to look at it that way especially when the context is, is focusing so much on that sinless new man. But do you think it's up to you, folks, to guard yourself? And I pray, God, that your whole so soul, body, and spirit be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who has called you who also will do it. You're not going to do it. You know, Calvinism, uh, and I hate that, I really do hate that term, I don't, uh, Calvin was wrong about a lot of things, but Calvinism believes in what it calls the perseverance of the saints, and I don't particularly like that word, and I, I know many other Calvinists that don't. I think it's the preservation of the saints. If God preserves us, which he says we he will do, then we'll persevere. So I don't know, maybe it's a play on words, but but I just have always believed in the accuracy of, of terms and, and, and words and how we use them. I believe that the emphasis of scripture is on the fact that God does it. You're not gonna win because of you. You're not gonna be victorious because of what you do. You are victorious because God gave you the victory. He always causes us to triumph. Always, okay? Someone says, well, you know, he does that in other people's lives, but, you know, it doesn't seem like he's doing that in mine. Well, then he's a liar. Either you're not his or he's a liar. God says he always causes us to triumph. He always causes us, always gives us the victory. Always. And there ought to be peace and rest and joy in every Christian's life.
Dearly beloved, the sacrifices of the law could not remove the conscious guilt of sin, but Jesus Christ did. And he perfected forever them whom he's setting apart. Being perfected forever is a long time. And how much are you going to modify that perfection? I mean, when he says he perfected you forever, does that mean he did a sloppy job? You know, some of you are good. Some of you are, are, are well, not so good. Some of you are really good. Some of you are not so good. Some of you are really bad. Some of you are very poor. I mean, that's the attitude, folks, that I see all the time. But how can we do that with, with God's word? It is God who guards us and the evil one cannot attach himself to us. Why? Why? Well, I believe it's because of that sinless new man created in righteousness and true holiness. Because we were born of God and folks, God does not produce or create sinful offspring. You know, it is a ridiculous notion to think that God could born us, pr pr produce something that, that we could be begotten of God and that, that somehow God begets sinners. It goes absolutely contrary to, to every single word from Genesis to Revelation. That is not what God does. If we are, because, because we are born of God, we cannot sin because his seed abides in us and we cannot sin. God protects us. God guards us. God keeps us. We absolutely know, it's a perfect tense, that those born of God do not sin. We also know that God keeps them. God guards them. The wicked one can't attach himself to them. How much peace, how much confidence do you want? And then we know, again, we know, verse 19, that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. We are of God, and the whole world lieth in the wicked one. The word lieth there is a present tense. The, the world continues to lie, always lies in the wicked one. So a contrast is being drawn here. We are not of the world. We know that we are not of the world. You know, and it isn't that there's good sin and bad sin. It's that we are of God, so we don't face death because of the sin that dwells in us. We do not face death because of that rotten, sinful old man. Oh God, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Dearly beloved, do you realize there are countless Christian friends of yours who are breaking their necks to deliver themselves from the body of that death? No peace, no rest, no joy, no confidence in what Christ has done. You know, it, it's something that they have to do. And they fight and they fight to try to resist sin. The first command given us, we saw it in Romans chapter 6, verse 11 to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We know that we are of God and we know the whole world lies in the wicked one. He's the prince and power of the air. He's the prince of this world, but we are of God. What a marvelous thought. We are of God. We can't lose. No wonder we have the victory. No wonder he always causes us to triumph because we are of God. We've been born of God. And so we have another no, all of these in the perfect tense. In the 20th verse, we know, perfectly know, that the Son of God has come. We know that. <laughs> For anybody to suggest that the Son of God hasn't come is to deny evidence and to deny history. You know, when you date a letter, you declare that truth. We know the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. How did he do that? Well, he did that through his word. I believe the understanding that God has given is that through his word, which is the testimony of Jesus Christ. You search the scriptures for in them, you think that you have eternal life, but you will not come unto me that you may have eternal life. And these are they that testify of me. Giving us an understanding in order that we may know. And now all of a sudden the no is not oida. It's, it was, it was oida, 
perfect knowledge in verse 18, oida in 19, oida at the beginning of 20, but now, now it's gnosko. You Greek students are familiar with that word. It's experiential knowledge. It's not perfect knowledge. It is experiential knowledge. Now it's an experiential knowing. I can interact with the word of God. I can interact with God. I can, I can trust God. I can't trust any other source but the testimony of this book. If I look at my experiences, if that's what I did, then I would I'd think, and boy, I, I'm sure every single one of you can relate to this. You'd think, boy, I, you know, I shouldn't have done that, this or the other thing. And so you, you look for some reason that all these bad things are happening you know, if I, and if I look at what happens to me, I may reach the wrong conclusion. We walk by faith, not by sight. But if I submit myself to the word of God, knowing his word is true, then I can have the confidence that I know it experientially. And that is what I believe he desires more than anything. I don't know how to put that into words. Day after day, I sit with this book and I rejoice in the fact that God's given me his word, that his word won't lead me astray. I know that a folk, by experience, I know that a focus on sin, self, the law, the world will lead me astray. That we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son, Jesus Christ, who is the true God. Well, the Mormons don't like that. You know, the Jehovah Witnesses don't like that, and we're kind of used to that, but we're not. what we're not used to is, is a, a large majority now of, of Christianity, mainstream Christianity, or Christian thought today, in which the deity of Jesus Christ is denied. It's a very sad, sad testimony of mankind's history. If Jesus Christ is not God, a very God, then you and I have no hope. If he isn't who he claimed to be, we have no hope. Even in his son, Jesus Christ, the true God in eternal life. And our eternal life, folks, is a long, long time. But, but what we want to do is make it a, make it a conditional thing. It's, it's a package. You know, eternal life is something that you can hold in your hand or you can throw it away. Folks, it isn't. It's life that never ends. Life that never ends can't end. If it can end, we, are, we already know from the, the earlier part of the fifth chapter that we're making God a liar, and worse than that, I believe we're blaspheming the work of Christ because he didn't do enough. Whatever it takes to have eternal life, he didn't. He didn't do enough. Most of the Christian friends that you know base the possession of eternal life to some degree on what they do and by whatever degree that is, they have by that much, I believe, reduced what Jesus Christ has done for them. The Holy Spirit in this, in this book, in this study, especially at the closing of this epistle, is warning against that. It's telling us that is not your portion. That is not what you've been given. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, that's all of us. That term of endearment, the beloved phrase that, that John used, used so much. Little children, keep yourselves from the idols. I don't think that these are pagan idols like, you know, Diana or, or images made from wood or stone. I think they're the idols of the human thought that detracts from the word of God, that adds to what Jesus Christ has done, that focuses on what man must do to qualify for eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from those idols. Amen. Let it be so. And so ends our study in 1 John. May these truths, folks, comfort your hearts. May every one of you know the peace of God that passes understanding, the joy that's unspeakable. And may we all continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. I think you'll be excited to, 
to learn where we're going from here in our studies. I want to thank you all once again for everything. I've, I've asked you to pray for the direction of this ministry. I know that God has honored those prayers. I continue to pray for you all daily. As we enter this new year of 2022, I think there's every reason to look up because our redemption draws nigh. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.